Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Europe podcast, available every morning on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It's Friday, the 9th of August here in London. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up today, the global stock market recovery continues as fears over the US economy ease. The US, Qatar, and Egypt call for new Gaza ceasefire talks next week as Israel braces for an expected attack from Iran. Plus, the UK considers tighter social media regulation after Keir Starmer's online confrontation with Elon Musk. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. A recovery in global shares is continuing this morning after signs of resilience in the US labour market. Wall Street rallied after US employment benefit applications fell by the most in nearly a year last week and the market reaction continuing in Asia today. Markets currently pricing in about 40 basis points of Federal Reserve rate cuts for September. But Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin says policymakers will be in a good position to assess the US economy over the coming months. I think you've got some time in a healthy economy to figure out whether this is an economy that's gently moving into a normalizing state that will allow you to, you know, in a steady, deliberate way, normalize rates, you know, and hit the stick the landing, if I can use another uh, balance beam uh, analogy. Or, you know, is this one where you really do have to lean into it? That's Thomas Barkin from the Richmond Fed there. Bank of Kansas City Fed President Jeffrey Schmidt indicated he's not ready to support a reduction in interest rates with inflation above the 2% target. The focus now shifts to US data next week, including consumer prices. The US, Qatar and Egypt are calling for a new round of Gaza ceasefire talks to be held on the 15th of August. It's the latest attempt by the Biden administration to end the conflict as the region braces for an expected Iranian attack on on Israel. According to a post on X from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office, Israel will send a delegation to the planned discussions. There was no immediate comment from Hamas. Meanwhile, US Air Force stealthy Raptor jets have arrived in the Middle East in a bid to deter an Iranian attack. An advisor to Kamala Harris says the Democratic presidential candidate doesn't support halting armed shipments, arms shipments to Israel. The tactic has been pushed by progressives keen on America taking assertive action to end the war in Gaza. But the vice president's national security advisor posted on social media that, quote, she will always ensure Israel is able to defend itself. Now to the presidential uh, run. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump has proposed three separate TV debates with Kamala Harris in September. The former president called Harris, quote, barely competent. She hasn't done an interview. She can't do an interview. She's barely competent and she can't do an interview. But I look forward to the debates because I think we have to set the record straight. Donald Trump speaking there. He has previously declined to commit to debates after Joe Biden uh, dropped out of the race. In an hour-long press conference, the Republican also said that presidents should have some say over interest rates and monetary policy, which would buck the Fed's tradition of political independence. The UK government is considering tightening online hate speech laws after provocations from figures including Elon Musk during two weeks of riots. Bloomberg has learned the government met social media executives earlier this week and is looking at introducing legal levers to force moderation of harmful content. Prime Minister Keir Starmer has been repeatedly attacked by ex-owner Elon Musk online, who's also shared numerous right-wing conspiracy theories about the riots. It's not the first time Musk has picked a fight with a world leader over the content on his platform. Earlier this year, Australia's Prime Minister Anthony Albanese called the tech giant CEO an arrogant billionaire. This isn't about freedom of speech. This is uh, a, an egotist. Mm. Uh, he is uh, someone who's totally out of touch uh, with the values that Australian families have. A- and this is causing great distress. I think it is causing damage to his own brand of uh, Twitter, which has now become X. Uh, He clearly uh, sees this as a vanity project for himself. Albanese's government has used legal powers to force Musk's platform to remove violent content in Australia. 
Now, in a moment, we're going to bring you more on the rally that we've seen in stocks this morning and also the latest developments on the Middle East. But first, this story caught our eye. Olympic dollars and how much athletes get for winning medals. Uh, so a number of stories about this on the Bloomberg Terminal because it really, well, a lot of Olympic athletes, of course, don't, don't get paid at all. I mean, there isn't a kind of prize money that goes with winning. But actually, the rewards very much depend on your sport, on your sponsorship and also on your country. So uh, US swimming chiefs apparently want their Olympic athletes to be paid more. They get a performance bonus, $250,000. But actually in the pool, the US didn't do that well. They did very well in athletics this year, not super well um, in the pool. Uh, The fewest gold medals since 1956. And so actually each US swimmer only got just over $5,000. US fencing and lots of teams want to see a bit more support for athletes. Yeah, indeed. Look, I mean, this is why we see so much in terms of corporate sponsorship. Mm. And even we have another story about the fencing team talking about how you know they're they have their phone on and their emails are being checked to see what Ooh. sort of deals they're going to be offered after the prominence that the Olympics uh, gives them but it's you know a broader question about how do you keep these elite athletes in the sport yeah absolutely UK rowers for example are trying to lead the charge uh, in terms of getting um, a little bit more money and, and kind of bonuses paid to UK athletes too anyway I thought it was interesting obviously after a couple of weeks of the Olympics well let's get back to the markets and economic story today a recovery of global shares continuing in Asia. That was after US initial jobless claims data fell by the most in nearly a year. We've also had um, new figures on CPI in China as well. Let's bring in Bloomberg editor Jill Desis for more on this. Uh, Jill, great to have you with us on the programme. How strong is the rebound that we're seeing in markets? And I suppose what does that tell us about the fears around the US economy and how much they've abated? Yeah, Stephen, it's a pretty significant rebound here. We're seeing um, some broad-based uh, rises in stocks across Asia right now, from Japan to South Korea and Australia. Um, we've also um, seen Hong Kong equities maintain some gains today. U.S. You know, stock futures are gaining, and all of this, yes, as you said, seems to be related to the fact that we're seeing, you know, uh, some some fears over a U.S. recession fade because of these initial claim uh, data. I mean, look, uh, these initial claims data decreased by seventeen thousand to twenty-three thousand uh, in the week. Uh, ended, um, you know, August 3rd. That's significantly lower than estimated. So you are seeing a bit of a retreat back a little bit. I will say that's not entirely unexpected because there are some seasonal adjustment effects for the month of July that we have to take into consideration and such. But I think um, particularly off of, um, you know, the data from just a couple of weeks ago that really triggered this big markets meltdown. I mean, this is um, some pretty encouraging news, um, you know, out of, out of the U.S. that maybe there's a little bit more resilience in there. And maybe we're back to the conventional wisdom from just about a month ago, which is, um, you know, sort of like a slower retreat that's not um, triggering any sort of immediate recession fears. Hmm. Okay. We've also had a number of Fed speakers. None seem to be close to the idea of an emergency rate cut or even, frankly, a jumbo rate cut or any rate cut at all, it would seem. So what are we thinking about the Fed path ahead? We do get that US uh, CPI data next week. Yeah, Caroline. Well, I think that, um, you know, I mean, when the markets were going crazy just last week and so, I know that there was some of that initial chatter about, oh my gosh, like, does the Fed need to make an emergency cut here? I think we're well off of, of there. I mean, we've heard from several central bankers over the past few days. Um, Austin Goolsby, the Fed uh, Chicago uh, p- president, was saying, look, like, you know, I mean, yes, like, jobs numbers are weak, but we really didn't, e- even then, like, you know, before we got these, um, these jobless claims data, I mean, he was saying, look, um, that's one month of data. We really need to be a bit cautious there. We don't really want to, um, you know, blow through normal, I think was his, um, you know, uh, kind of the, the the thinking there. So, yeah, I mean, maybe you do see something still in September. Um, but, um, you know, in any case, you know, obviously like cut probably by the end of the year, but it does seem like they're at least tamping down this idea that, um, you know, there would be anything that would be a, a more drastic emergency measure taken. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the language from Jeffrey Schmidt from the, the Kansas City Fed is not a voting member, but interesting to, to hear him saying that we're not there in terms of supporting a reduction in interest rates because inflation is still above tar- target and him seeing the labour market as being still healthy despite some cooling. So giving us an idea of, I suppose, some of the divergence of views that exists um, within those members of the Fed. Jill, let's turn to the data from China that we've had out this morning as well. Um, this is an interesting reading on, on where the Chinese economy is. 
Yeah, uh, China's consumer price has actually picked up a bit more than expected in July. So a lot of this is seasonal factors like weather. Um, but uh, look, I mean, at the end of the uh, at the end of the day, I mean, the CPI index. I mean, it really still only climbed zero point five percent from a year earlier. So um, we're not talking about any kind of massive jump in CPI producer uh, price inflation. By the way, um, you know, the producer prices remain stuck in deflation for I think at this point it's twenty two, twenty three consecutive months. So still a lot of issues there. I think, you know, when it comes to China, um, you know, the inflation spending story in China has been pretty weak all year. You have seen a little bit of an uptick, which is a bit of an improvement, but it still, um, you know, does show that lingering weakness um, in overall demand. I think in China, too, if you cut out um, food and energy costs, which are, you know, more volatile, that core CPI figure um, rose just 0.4 percent. That's the, 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 the weakest reading since January. So you are continuing to see some issues there within the Chinese economy in terms of that demand picture. I'm not sure that that there's any kind of, you know, show of how that would meaningfully improve over the next few months right now. Mm, Okay, Uh, Jill, thank you so much for being with us this morning and taking us through the market story, uh, including the data from China and the discussion around uh, US rates. Uh, Bloomberg's editor, Jill Desis. Let's turn to the Middle East now. The US, Qatar and Egypt are urging ceasefire talks next Thursday. Um, between Israel and Hamas. That's after the Israeli Prime Minister has said that they are sending a negotiating team to those talks uh, set for the 15th of August. Let's get the latest now from our Bloomberg Horizons anchor, uh, Jamana Bersetchi. Jamana, great to have you with us. What are the expectations then for reaching a ceasefire deal? Well, the expectations are still quite low, but I think it is notable that you had the U.S. president, the emir of Qatar and the president of Egypt all put out this joint statement together saying uh, that they are really calling on Israel and Hamas both to take part in this final round of negotiations to finalize the hostage and ceasefire deal. They said, and this is a quote, only the details remain to be negotiated. And we found out a short while ago that Israel will be sending a team to those negotiations. We haven't yet heard from Hamas. But of course, uh, the backdrop to all of this is that we found out earlier this week, Hamas have appointed Yahya Sinwar as their new political leader. And that at the time was taken to be a, a bit of a a, uh, a setback for the ceasefire discussions, namely because of Yahya Sinwar, who he represents, uh, being the mastermind of October 7, being still one of the people that is situated in Gaza, very close to the hostages themselves. So it raised a lot of questions as to the appetite from Hamas's side to continue with these discussions. But the fact that uh, the presidents of uh, U.S. and Egypt and Qatar are all urging uh, these sides to continue with the discussion is progress, Mm -hmm. you could say. And just wanted to add as well, from Iran's perspective, the president there, Pazishkian, had a call with President Macron earlier this week, also talking about the fact that Israel should accept a truce in Gaza in order to reduce tensions in the Middle East. So this isn't just about Gaza, but about tensions in the region as a whole. Mm. What has the US been doing then in the face of a possible attack on Israel by Iran or its proxies? Yeah, so the U.S. are pursuing, I would say, a double mandate at this point. On one hand, they are, of course, pushing for a diplomatic solution, urging all sides to come to the table. But on the same time, at the same time, they are also looking to um, in, in invoke strategic deterrence. And what I mean by strategic deterrence is that they're deploying more and more military assets to the region. Uh, we found out yesterday that um, the fighter jets, the F-22 fighter jets, have now arrived in the Middle East. Uh, the Central Command put up a post on X saying that they were there. This is the first time they've been deployed to the region since June of 2023. Uh, We know that um, some uh, military vessels have arrived as well, uh, in addition to other fighter jets and other military equipment that's being deployed. So they are building up a military presence uh, with the view of deterring Iran and its proxies from engaging in a bigger warfare in, in the Middle East at this point. So it is a two-pronged uh, approach. On one hand, they want to pursue the diplomatic channels. On the other hand, they also are beefing up the region in anticipation of a likely response out of Iran and its proxies. Jumana, while all of these things are happening outside of Gaza, what do we know about what's happening inside Gaza? 
Yes. So uh, the latest that we know from within Gaza is that the Israeli military has ordered another mass evacuations around Khan Yunus. This is uh, Gaza's second largest city. And you will recall that earlier on uh, during the early stages of this war, it did suffer a lot of destruction during some of the air and ground operations that happened a couple of months ago. And then since then, the attention moved on to Rafah. But what we've noticed in the last couple of months is uh, some new uh, hotspots are flaring up in the Gaza, again within Gaza and with other cities in Gaza simply because Hamas have had the ability to regroup. And the regrouping means that Israel's military are going to go after the spots where they think that Hamas have the ability to conduct uh, more war efforts once again. And so this, for this reason, uh, we are in a situation now where the Israeli military is now warning the citizens or the citizens are still there uh, to evacuate in anticipation of another assault. Uh, and of course, this all comes at a time where and the Strip as a whole is still facing a severe humanitarian crisis. Um, there are ongoing restrictions and aid, uh, ongoing fighting that is limiting the access of aid to many of the residents that still need it. And the overall uh, death toll within the Strip is approaching 40,000. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning on London DAB Radio, the Bloomberg Business app and Bloomberg.com. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day, right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.